Well, this morning we are going to be in the New Testament book of Colossians. And so if you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and turn there? If you need a Bible, we have some guys coming forward right now and they love to hand you a Bible. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be there in just a moment. I got a question for you. You ready? You ready? Patty Harris, are you ready for a question? I don't know why. I'm just kind of staring right at you guys. So I'm putting you on the, on the spot. Question for you. If you could, if you were able, would you like to know when and how you were going to die? Now, I know that can seem like kind of a strange question, maybe a morbid question to ask on an Easter Sunday. But if you could know the answer to those two questions, would you want to know? And I imagine that the answer to those two questions might impact how you live right now. Now, if, if you found out that you were going to pass away peacefully in your bed, in your home at the age of 104, surrounded by your great-grandkids and your great-great-grandkids, I imagine that doesn't impact how you live tomorrow or next month or even next year. That may give you a sense of peace. It may relieve some anxiety you might have about the future. It might even give you a sense of anticipation and joy. I'm actually going to meet my great-great-grandchildren. But it's probably not going to impact how you live tomorrow. But what if you found out that 24 months from today, you're going to pass away having battled an incurable and painful disease? I imagine that information changes how you live right now. In fact, I imagine that you will begin to view every aspect of your life, every decision that you make in your life, you're going to view it through the lens that in 24 months, I'm passing away. And I imagine that the, the information about how and when you are going to die probably is going to cause you to respond in one of two ways. You may just find yourself emotionally paralyzed. You may just become overwhelmed by fear. You may become yourself overwhelmed by just anxiety and worry. Or it could cause you to now live life much more intentionally, much more purposefully. You may realize, I got 24 months left. I got to live on mission. Now, the reality is most of us don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the end of our life when we're going to die. Well, what do we spend most of our time thinking about? Well, our, our life being alive. We, we, we spend most of our time thinking about what we want to do while we're alive, who we're becoming while we're alive, what we want to accomplish while we're alive. Most of us don't think about the end. We think about the present and the near future. You know, when Jesus came into this world, he viewed his life and he viewed his death very differently. See, when Jesus came into this world, he recognized that he was born into this world for the purpose of dying. And so when Jesus thought about his death, it wasn't something that was going to bring an end to his hopes and his dreams and the things that he wanted to do in this life. When he thought about his death, he saw it as the fulfillment of what he came to accomplish in this life. There was a man named Isaiah who lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came into this world. Isaiah was a prophet. I mean, he spoke the words of God to the people around him. And Isaiah said these words. He prophesied about what would happen in the life of Jesus. He said, but he, speaking of the Messiah or speaking of Jesus, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. When Isaiah saw, thought about the life of Jesus, he was thinking about his life through the lens that he would lay down his life on the cross for our sins. Shortly before Jesus was born, an angel appeared to Joseph, the man who was engaged to be married to Mary, who would give birth to Jesus. And this angel said these words to Joseph. And she, speaking of Mary, Joseph, she's going to have a son. And you're to name him Jesus. 
for he will save his people from their sins. When an angel spoke to Joseph about the son that's going to be born, he spoke about the death he's going to experience by laying down his life on a cross for our sins. When Jesus was around the age of 30 and he was about to enter into his public ministry and John the Baptist was preparing the way for the ministry of Jesus and John the Baptist sees him in a crowd, he says this, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus introduced Jesus through the lens of what he is going to do through his death by laying down his life on the cross for our sins. And then Jesus himself, when he spoke of his own life, this is what he said at one point. He said to the crowd and the disciples, he says, for even the Son of Man, and in that expression he's referring to himself, he says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the reason that Jesus came, the purpose that he saw of his own life was his death, laying down his life on the cross for our sins. Now, how many people that you know before they were born and after they were born, people talk about them and their lives through the lens of their death? I imagine we don't know many people like that. How many people that you know, when they speak about their own life, they're constantly talking about their death? We probably don't know a whole lot of people like that. And in fact, if they were, we would be concerned about them. And yet, when Jesus came into this world, the prophets viewed his life, the angels viewed his life, and Jesus himself viewed his life through the lens that he would one day lay down his life on the cross. Now, why? Why? Why would a cross, an instrument in the Roman Empire that's used to declare guilty to criminals, that, that, that's used to cause someone to die a painful death, why is this the purpose of anyone's life? Well, that's the question we're going to spend time with this morning. We're going to look at why Jesus was born for the purpose of laying down his life on the cross. Why? Why was that his life mission? And why do we, over 2,000 years later, gather in a building just like this, and, and we come in a place of deep gratitude, giving our worship to Jesus, because he did this on our behalf. So to help answer this question, we're going to begin in Colossians chapter 2. If you're not already there, would you please turn there with me? Colossians is a New Testament book, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. We're just going to read a couple verses here. Colossians was written by a man by the name of Paul, and he's writing to other Christians, and he's saying this. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses, meaning your, your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Then he set aside, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so this passage tells us that humanity has, or for some, had a record of debt that stands against them. And then this passage says that this record of debt was then nailed to the cross of Jesus. You know, dur during the time that this letter that, that Paul wrote, uh, during the time this was written, a, a record of debt or a certificate of, of debt was a handwritten document that, that, that someone would write pledging themselves to pay back amount that they owed. 
or simply we can just call it an IOU. I owe you this amount or this thing, and so I'm signing this document saying, I will pay this back. Now imagine every single one of us in here has experienced having some kind of debt. We, we've experienced having some situation where we owed someone something. And if you've ever been in a place in which that debt was to the point in which you couldn't pay it back, you know the burden of that debt. I remember sitting with a man a few years ago, and he had been out of work for a while, and then now it got to the point where he could no longer pay his mortgage, and the bank was at a place in which they were going to now take possession of his home, and he had four kids still living at home. He was a family of six. He didn't know what he was going to do, where they were going to live, and while nothing was physically crushing this man, you could just look in his face. You could look in his eyes. You could just look at his body language. And, and, and this situation and this debt was not so slowly crushing him. And he sat there with his wife next to him asking the question, how do I get through this? Debt that we cannot pay it can crush us. It can take away our freedom. It can make us a slave to that debt. It can steal joy from our life. It can take hope away from our life. It can take peace away from our life. That's why we have the expression, drowning in debt. Because that's exactly what it feels like. Some of you know what that feels like. Maybe some of you are experiencing that right now. But, but even in the most intense, overwhelming debts, it doesn't seem like someone needs to die in that situation. It doesn't seem like there's been a situation where a bank comes and says, we've got to take your life right now. It certainly doesn't seem like Jesus, the Son of God, would need to die simply because we have some debt that's being held against us. And yet Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says the reason Jesus died on the cross is because you and I had a debt that stood against us. And this debt wasn't a money problem. This debt was a sin problem. See, our, our debt was our sin before God. Sin in its most basic definition is just missing the mark. It's falling short of something. And so sin in the context of our relationship with God is that we have missed the mark of God's perfection. Sin is any thought or any decision or any action that misses the mark of God's holiness, of His righteousness. The Bible tells us we've all missed that mark. We've all sinned. No one is perfect. And of course, the Bible doesn't need to tell us that. I mean, it doesn't take a whole long, lot of self, uh, you know, reflection to recognize I'm not perfect. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time to look around this world and see, hey, we're imperfect people living in an imperfect world. But when we talk about our imperfections, I think we often talk about them in a casual way. I mean, I'm sure you've probably had this expression or heard someone say, hey, no one's perfect. And we don't say that with a sense of alarm. We don't say that with the sense of no one's perfect. In fact, we, we often use it as a way to comfort other people or comfort ourselves. Hey, no one's perfect. In fact, if there's a public figure who, who, who says words that were inappropriate or wrong or commits some actions that are just socially inter or culturally inappropriate or wrong or breaks the law, and in his apology, maybe somewhere in that apology, they make a statement, hey, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm going to mess up sometimes. And that is true. As humanity, we're not perfect. No one is. But the reality is the fact that no one is perfect, the fact that we have sinned before God, is actually something that should alarm us. Because the Bible tells us that the consequences of missing the mark of God's perfection, the consequences of that is death. That's what sin produces in our life. It produces both a physical death and a spiritual death. Now, sometimes we can hear that statement and think, well, why does it produce death? That seems pretty extreme. I mean, why do we all, all automatically have to move from a sin before God to death? 
Because sin separates us from a perfect God. When we who are imperfect sin, or sin making us imperfect, that separates us. When there's a separation between one who is holy and just and perfect and between us who are now unholy and imperfect. As much as we want God who is holy and righteous and just, as much as we want Him to have a casual view of our imperfection and sin, as much as we want Him to say, ah, that's just humanity, no one's perfect. That would be inconsistent with the character of God. That would be inconsistent with someone who is holy and righteous and just. You know, whether you believe there is a God or not, if we were building our picture of what a God should look like, I imagine that we want Him to be righteous. I mean, we, we, we want a God who has a strong sense of right and wrong. I imagine if we're developing our own image of God, we want a God who is just. We want a God who's not going to allow injustice. Because that's what we want from our own leaders. That's what we want from our president. That's what we want from our political leaders. That's what we want from our judges. Someone who will rule and judge with a strong sense of what is right and what is wrong. What is just and what is unjust. This is why we sometimes will ask the question, if God is good, why does he allow evil? You see, we want God to be holy and just. This is why we love verses like Amos 5.24, a verse that Martin Luther King Jr. quoted in his fight for injustice, in which, which the verse says, but let justice roll like a river. Like, let, let righteousness never be a, be a never-ending stream. See, that's what we want, isn't it? We look at our own life, and we want there to be justice in our life. We want the wrongs to be righted. We want God to be a holy and perfect God. And that when he sees evil, he takes, he allows that evil to be accountable for that wrong. Here's the problem. Is we want God to be holy and just with other people's sins. We want God to be holy and just when we see wickedness around us. We just don't want God to be holy and just when it comes to our own sin. We don't want God to be holy and just when we miss the mark. But can we say, God, I want you to be just over there, but, but not in this part of my life. Oh God, I want you to be holy over here, but not in this part of my life. But the reality is God is perfectly holy and perfectly righteous and perfectly just. And so our, our sin before God, whether that sin is, however you rate that sin, if it's like one of those really bad sins or really small sins, that's how sometimes we talk about it. Well, whatever that sin is that we view in our mind, we have to recognize that we have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. Therefore, we now have a debt before God. And verse 14 tells us this debt has legal demands. This is a debt that requires separation from a holy God. This is a debt that demands death. Separation from God in a very real place called hell. And so when we look at the cross, and we look at this instrument of death, an instrument of punishment, an instrument that produces death. This is what you and I have earned through our disobedience. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so when we look at the cross, this is what you and I have earned. This is what our sins lead us to. And when we look at the fact that our sins earn death, we see something about the character and the nature of God. That when we see that our sins deserve death, we see the justice of God. God's just to punish our sins. 
But if the cross of Christ that we celebrate as Christians just simply represents our guilt and our death, then Easter would be a very sad day. It would be a day not of hope and celebration. It would simply be us mourning our pending death. And, and by putting a cross front and center for all of us to see, it would really just be mocking us, taunting us. Hey, guess what? This is what your sin deserves. But the good news is that the cross of Christ doesn't point us to our death. The cross of Christ points us to the death of Jesus. And so while the picture of the cross is a picture of God's justice, the picture of the cross is also this. This is a picture of another part of the nature and the character of God. That when at the cross, we also see God's love. Why do we see God's love on the cross? Well, John 4, 9 through 10 says this. This is how God showed his love among us. That he sent his one and only son to the world that we might live through him. Now, now why is that love? Well, because the next part of the verse says this. This is love. John's saying, I want, you to, I want you to hear this. This is love. Not that we loved God. Not that we did anything to earn God's love, deserve God's love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The word atoning or atonement simply means to make right what was wrong. What was wrong? Well, clearly what we see right here. We sin before God, and our sin separates us from God, demanding death. So out of his love for us, God says, I'm, I'm going to make right what had been wrong through Jesus sacrificing something for us. And so what did Jesus sacrifice? Well, Jesus sacrificed his own life. He, he gave his life for our own life. So when we look at the cross, it doesn't point to us. When we look at the cross, and we look at the justice of God, and we look at the love of God, it now points us to Jesus. Because he gave what we could not give. This is why 1 John 4.10 begins with these startling words, these amazing words. This is love. See, the cross is a statement of God's justice. It's also a statement of God's incredible love. It's a statement that creator has given his life for his creation. And so this brings us back to Colossians 2, verse 14, in which we're told that our sins have been forgiven because our record of debt that was against us was canceled. Now it's important when we read that, that the debt itself wasn't canceled. It wasn't Jesus taking our record of debt and tearing it up. That's not justice. You see, it's that the record of debt that was against us was canceled. What happened to the debt? Well, it says that he set it aside by nailing it to the cross. See, Jesus says, I I I'll take that record of debt. And he took it upon himself. And he says, I I'm now responsible for that debt. Or to put it another way, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus was fully perfect and without sin. Jesus was fully God and fully human, and he came to be our substitute to do what we could not do. He took on our debts. You know, when people were crucified, one of the things that they would do is they would put a sign up above them. And that sign would show the reason that they're on this cross. Murderer. Thief. King of the Jews. And 
so something was nailed up there on top of Jesus. Our debt. This man is being crucified because he owes a debt to God. When Jesus laid down his life on the cross, he took upon himself all of the sins of humanity, your sin and my sin. Our past sins, our present sins, our future sin, that sin from last night, that sin from this morning. And he took it upon himself and he became sin. And then the Bible says that right before he breathed his last breath, he said this phrase, it is finished. It's just kind of an interesting thing to say right before you die. That, that phrase is actually an accounting term that literally means paid in full. What Jesus was, was saying is that when the sin of, our, of humanity was placed upon his body and he was crucified on that cross, paying our debt, Jesus was saying as a representative for God, your debt has been paid. I paid it. I paid it. Romans 3.25 says this, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. You know, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus does not automatically bring salvation to the world. Uh, but the cross and the resurrection offers salvation to all who receive this gift in faith. And so as we stand here with the cross and, and we understand what, what, what happened and occurred on the cross through the God, justice of God and through the love of God that our debt was paid, this cross now makes an invitation to you. Will you place your hope and faith in Jesus as the only one who can forgive your sins and give you salvation? This is why we have the great invitation of John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him, trusting fully that Jesus, the Son of God, has laid down his life on the cross and he offers you salvation for all who believe. It says you, you will not perish. You, you will not experience eternal separation from God, but you will have eternal life. You know, next week, we're going to look at a verse in Ephesians chapter 2 that tells us why we're able to know salvation in Christ. This wonderful verse in Ephesians chapter 2 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. And so this verse says that we can add two more aspects to the character of God upon this cross. We can add up here God's grace. And we add up here God's mercy. You see, when we look at the cross, we no longer see an instrument of cruel punishment, of death. When we look at the cross, we get to see the character of God on display. A God of justice. A God of love. A God of mercy. And a God of grace. What I was unable to do, he was able. What I made wrong, he made right. And so we come back to our original question, why? Why did Jesus make the cross the mission of our life? Because he loves you and he loves me. Look at these amazing words in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the pain and the shame and the humility of the cross. 
Why would this be anyone's joy? Because you are his joy. Because you are his joy. For the joy of knowing that you will not be condemned to death, but you may have life in him. He said, it is my joy. And so at the cross, we see the character of God. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we get to respond. We get to respond. Look, look what Jesus says to us. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know what our joy gets to be? To give our life fully and completely to the one who gave his life to us. That's our response to the cross. To give our life fully to the one who gave his life for us. I want to invite the worship team to come on up. We get to respond to what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And one of the most appropriate ways for us to respond is respond out of gratitude, to respond out of thanksgiving, to respond out of worship. And so I invite you, all who are here, let's stand and respond in worship.